Hey, everybody. How y'all doing? Woohoo! Y'all glad to be here tonight? Yeah. Come on. All right, young people and us adults. Here we go. Y'all ready?
Amen. You can be seated. Hallelujah. I love that song. It's fun. All right, please watch our screen. Welcome to Bayou Blue Assembly. Listen closely to hear about our upcoming events. Today at... If you want to get involved and start serving here at Bayou Blue, the Guardian class is your first step. So join us today at 4.30 in the Kids Church and find out how you can get involved. Tomorrow night at 7 p.m., we'll be having our monthly board our monthly board meeting. We are so excited to be releasing our new Great Kids merch. Grab an order form from our Kids Church or the Welcome Center to order your Great Kids shirt today. On Sunday, September 3rd, we'll be having baby dedications. If you want your child to be dedicated, call the church office and get them registered today. Registration for our Men of Standards 2023 conference, Set Free, is officially open. The conference will be October 27th and 28th, and former Angola pastor Justin Singleton will be coming to preach for us. Registration will be available at the door, but you can pre-register online to get a free conference t-shirt. In February of next year, missionaries Mike and Marigold Cheshire will be taking a biblical studies tour of Israel. If you're interested in going and learning about the very places that Jesus was, then talk to Pastor Janet today so that you can get signed up. Lastly, don't forget to join us tonight for our Sunday night service starting at 6 p.m. We would love to see you there. Click sign up and then make an account. Join our community today using Realm. All right, awesome. And don't forget, you can give online or you can give right there, right here today. Take the little envelope and put it in the box. Amen. Stand with us. Turn around and greet someone. Hug somebody tonight. Let them know you're glad that they are here with us tonight.
praise in this place. He's holding on to us. So good. worship you tonight. Manifest your presence in this place. You inhabit the praises of your people. That means that you're coming right here with us when we lift you up. You are right here with us. We love you and we praise you in this place.
no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. Oh, yeah. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me.
gave his only begotten son, Jesus.
hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to you, Jesus. Yes, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to you, God. You know, as they're singing, show us your glory, I, I'm looking across the congregation and, and I'm seeing little things. You know, I, I look up here and I see Matthew singing and, and I think about how God showed His glory as He healed him a long time ago that the glory of God was revealed in a healing process. I, I look across and I see some of y'all that came and got saved, gave your hearts to God. Man, and God has just become flourishing in your life that not only are you coming to church, but now, man, you're going to Bible college and you're doing what God called you to do. I'm telling you, we're looking at the glory of God manifested. I'm so blessed to look across and see Jason here worshiping God with his wife. And, and I think about where Jason came from and I see how God's glory has been manifested inside of him. Y'all, as we pray, show us your glory. you got to understand he's been showing us his glory. Look at Kurt sitting there. Man, God showed his glory in cancer and heart and touching his life. The glory of God is being shown all across Across this place we're seeing the glory we're singing a song but some of y'all ain't getting the glory some of y'all not seeing what God has done as we sing this song show us your glory I want you to begin to think about where you came from look across the congregation see people's lives see somebody that the glory of God has changed everything and then worship him like you ought to be worshiped him. Amen. Sing that some more. Change everything, change for 
yes, hallelujah. Oh, yes, Lord God. Glory to you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Brother Jason came and said that God had given him a word he wanted to share, so I'm going to ask him to come and, and share the word that God gave him. showing his glory to Moses when Moses is up in the mountain with him and he's spending time with God and he's fasting and he's praying and he's in relationship with God and he says God your presence is great but I want a little bit more show me your glory let me see you in the most real way in the most up close way that I possibly can and God said Moses if I let you see all of me you wouldn't make it but I'll put you behind this rock and I'll allow you to see the back of me so you can experience my glory. So tonight, as you're praying, as you're asking, as you're seeking for God to show you his glory, he'll do it. Ask him and he'll do it. We have his presence, but we want more. We want more. We want him to show us his glory and he'll do that. In every sense possible, he'll show you with your eyes so that you can see him. He'll show you through your ears so you can hear him, so you can feel him. He'll do that. He'll give you he'll, that revelation in your heart through the confirmation of Holy Spirit that his glory is moving. So while you're hungering and you're thirsting and you're seeking and you're asking to show us your glory, God, as you're doing that, he will do it you seek for it like Moses. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Y'all give the Lord a hand clap of praise. <laughs> Glory to you, Jesus. I believe the beginning of anything that we do starts with us seeking. It says, seek and you shall find. I think a lot of times we show up and just, God, whatever you want to do, we're just going to, but we're not seeking anything deeper. And I believe that God is looking for a people that are seeking. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. <laughs> Glory to you, God. Amen. Hallelujah. Y'all may be seated. I love it when God shows up and just touches. It just ministers to my heart to watch the things of God. To, you know, I, I was made to feel a little bit old this week with uh, Zach and Megan getting married. It just, you know, I, I remember when they would come to my office to get candy after church. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, I saw all you young people. Y'all keep coming. Maybe one day you'll get married. <laughs> Amen. If you'll open your Bibles to Mark, the 12th chapter we're going to read there, I want to talk about what if I give all, right? And I want to talk about some lessons I've learned about what I give. Anybody ever learn a lesson when you do something? The greatest lessons I've ever learned are the lessons that I learned the hard way. Some of y'all, some of y'all feeling me. But anything that comes easy to me, I lose easily. But anything I got to work for, I always remember it, right? And so there are some things that I want us to look at, some things that I want us to think about, because I believe that we, we miss the mark sometimes because we don't understand the process of giving and what giving means. Amen? And so Mark 12, 41, as Jesus sat near the temple treasury, he watched the people as they dropped in their money. Many rich men dropped in lots of money. Then a poor widow came along and dropped in two little copper coins worth about a penny. 
He called his disciples together and said to them, I tell you that this poor widow put more in the offering box than all the others, for the others put in what they had to spare for, from their riches. But she, poor as she is, put in all she had. She gave all she had to live on. Father, I ask that you would allow me to speak your word, touch the heart of the hearer that, God, they would receive from you. Father, I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So the first lesson about giving that we have to understand, it's not the size or the amount of the gift, it's what it means to you. It's what you give out of you to God that makes the difference. There were so many, and Jesus said there were lots of people giving a lot of stuff. You know, how many of y'all know you, you may not have as much to give as somebody else when it comes to finances or, or even other areas of your life. You don't have a lot to spare. You're just getting by on whatever it is you have. And other people seem to have so much to give. I look across our platform and I think about the worship team that we have and, and how they, they give worship unto God. And, and man, that, that is just blows me away. Because, you know, we have people in here who can sing, but they sit back and say, well, I, I can't sing like that. So I don't want to be up front because it, it, it's not going to be as good as when they do it. But can I tell you, that's not the heart that God wants. God wants the heart of the person who's given everything that they have. Maybe you can't, well, you could probably sing a lot better than me, but maybe you can't sing as well as somebody else. And so you hold back that gift or that talent from God because you think, well, it's just not that great. But I'm telling you that God wants you to give that gift that you have inside of you. And he wants you to make it as a sacrifice to him. Uh, just like this little woman, this widow woman who, who only had about a penny's worth of money to give. Jesus said she gave everything that she had. That was the money she had left to live on. Can I tell you, there has to be a heart process that says, you know what? This is all I got. It ain't much. and It ain't going to make a big difference in me. It ain't going to make a big difference anywhere. But God, I'm going to invest in you. Instead of me holding it back for me and trying to see what I can do with this little bit, I'm just going to give it to you and trust that, God, if I give it to you, you'll make it more than it, than it is in the kingdom. And it's not with the attitude of, I'm going to give this penny and God will give me 10000 Some people want to, they want to think, well, if I give this, God will give me this back. And you know, that's not the way it works. God's going to take care of your needs according to his riches and glory. How many of y'all know sometimes money's not what I need? Sometimes I need peace. And ain't no amount of money in the world can take the place of peace. Sometimes you need a healing. And I'm going to tell you what, you trade every dime you have for a healing. I know that because people go to the doctors and they go to the hospitals and they, they have to pay all this money to try to figure out how to make themselves better because if they don't, they're going to die. And they want to live. So they're willing to give everything that they have and, and put money and have to pay it back over time. You know, we had uh, our kids, you know, when Josh was born, we, we had to pay him off as we went. And we almost let him come repossess him. <laughs> but, you know, we had to pay it off by the month. We didn't have enough money to pay all the bills. And so Sister Janet paid what we could. But you know what? We wouldn't have taken anything for him. We'd have done whatever we had to do to keep keep paying and taking care of him because we needed to. But when it comes to your own personal health, how much money is too much? When your children are sick, how much money is too much? Well, of course, you pay what you have to pay because you love your family, you love your, your kids, you love your spouses, so we do that. And so when we talk about what we're giving to what we're giving back, don't think that God says, well, you give me the money and I'll give you money back because that might not be what it is. But it's the heart of what you're doing. It's the heart of what you're giving. You may find yourself down to, to your last bit of patience, Right? And, and you're supposed to work in the nursery at church today. And you've just had a really bad week. And you just don't want to have to face those kids. <laughs> right? And so you, 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 you send a little message, oh, I'm not going to be able to make it today. Something's wrong. Don't know what, but something got to be wrong because I ain't coming. 
or you, 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 you're there and, and you're saying, you know, I, I really know that I committed to do this at church, but, oh, I'm just, I'm tired. Man, I didn't sleep good last night. And boy, that bed feels so good today, right? And, and after all, it's just one little thing that I'm given. It's not a big deal. It's one little position, one, one, one service. I, I just don't want to do that. But I'm telling you, there is a, a process of sacrifice that God's looking at. That when I give what I have, not that, well, you know, Sister Connie, she's crazy. She's at everything, doing everything, always here, always there. I mean, that's just who she is. And you say, well, won't you go do it? She said, oh, I got it. I got it. I'm fine. Go here. You know? So you say, well, I can't do what Sister, what Sister Connie does. She does so much. Well, you, you know, and you're right. And there are other people who, who give so much of their time and so much of their effort. I mean, they're just so over the top in, in what they do. You know, when, when we just went to nationals and our, our, our youth pastors uh, taking the, the, the youth to go to national fine arts, our kids' pastors went. That's just over the top. It's not like they don't have anything else to do. But they gave that as well. And you say, yeah, but I can't do what they do. That's right, you can't. But you can do something. You have something to give. Maybe you don't have like the many rich people that came through there, just gave all the, I just got this extra time. I got this extra this. I'm just going to give some of the extra. But you say, you know, all I have is this. And I'm going to give it. I remember, it's been several years ago, that we went to Africa. And, 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 and Brandon and them were coming to Africa. And he came to me and he said, hey, God told me to pay for you and Sister Janet. I think Sister Janet said, do you know how much it's going to cost? He said, yes, ma'am, I can add. <laughs> he said, God told me to. And I thought, wow. That's, and that was a lot. We got, went to Africa, came back, and his work shut down. I mean, shut down. He, I, I know he thought, maybe I miss God. <laughs> I don't know. But you know what? God met them. And, but it was in that process, his family began to go through some stuff. And here now, we see them growing up and in church and, and what God's doing and Melissa in Bible college. And, and I think about, you know, they didn't, God didn't pour all that money back into their lives. But God showed up because of the sacrifices that are made. I want you to understand that, that, that there's a process that we do, that, that we give, and, and it doesn't matter. God's not looking at how much you have to give. He's looking at what you're willing to sacrifice in the kingdom for him. I'm going to tell you, God doesn't need your money. The, the, the church is glad when you give. But that's going to pay our bills. It don't help God. It ain't going to get you to heaven. And so when you begin to come to that place where you say, well, I don't, I don't, I mean, I have plenty of money to give, but that's not what God's asking me to give. What is it that God wants you to give in the kingdom? That's a question you have to ask yourself because you can't say within yourself, I just don't have enough that it's going to make a difference. That little lady, it was no way she thought her penny was going to make a difference in, in the temple's operation. But she gave it as unto God. She gave the little bit that she had and said, God, I'm giving it to you. That's trust, right? She trusted God. To be her provider. She said, all I have. She's a widow woman. She didn't have anybody to come along behind her and take care of her. So she took what she had. She said, God, I'm giving it to you as a sacrifice unto you. Y'all, when we give what we have unto God as a sacrifice, God takes care of it. God, I don't know what God did for that widow woman, but I promise you, God took care of her. We know in the Old Testament, when Elijah told the widow woman, go make me something to eat and something to drink before you eat for yourself, which I thought was kind of rude. But she did it, and God supplied food for her and her son through the rest of the famine. 
because of her heart to be obedient. I'm telling you, you may not have but a little, but the little that you're willing to give, God will multiply back into your life. You can look over and over in the Word of God. The, the woman whose husband was a prophet who died, she didn't know how she was going to pay her bills. The debtors were coming to take her boys to put them to work until they could pay off their debt. And she said, I don't know what to do. My husband gave all that he had. We don't have much. What are we going to do, man of God? He said, go, what do you have in your house? It's just a little bitty cruise of oil. He said, you go to every neighbor you have and get as many pots, as many bowls as you can. We'll get them in your house, close the doors, and start pouring that oil into them bowls. Now, when, when, we, how many of y'all know that you can only put so much and take so much? He started pouring that oil she started pouring in this bowl, and it's getting full. She says, hey, boys, wait, give me another bowl. This bowl's full. And filled another one, and then another one, and then another one, and then another one. And they're, they're filling all the bowls up in the house out of this cruise of oil that, that ought to be empty. Should have been empty a long time ago. Filled every bowl in the house, and then it stopped. They sold the, the, the oil, got the money they needed to pay all their debt, plus had money to live on. Now, it may have looked like at the moment when she, her husband died and she didn't know how she was going to pay her bills, what are we going to do? But her husband had been giving what he had to God the whole time. Can I tell you, God knows what we've given, and God takes great record of what we're doing, and he provides for us. One of the first lessons you have to learn in giving is God's not impressed by the amount of your gift but by the heart of your gift. If your gift comes from your heart, then God cares and God honors that. But, you, but you've, got, you've got to be willing to give God as much or as little as, as, as you have to give and trust Him with it. That's, that's one of the first things that, that we learn about that Sister Janet and I, when we were working in Eunice, and we had $5 a month left to our name after we paid all of our bills. And we thought about it. Well, you know, let's we start a savings account or a retirement account. You know, we were, we were young. Lots of time to save money. $5 a month wasn't going to add up fast, but it'd be something. And we looked at it. We talked about it. And we had a missionary friend that we had seen. And he said, you know, I'm just trying to raise money to, to get on the mission field to go and to teach people and to reach the, in Bangladesh is where he was going. And I, 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 on the way home, I said to Jenna, I said, you know, why don't we give him that money? She said, let's do it. So we gave that $5. We put it in missions. And you know what? It wasn't long after that God moved us here. God blessed us. We've, we've been so blessed and so honored. We didn't give that $5 trying to think we were going to work something out and God was going to have to give us. Our hearts were moved with his, with his passion to want to go on the mission field, that we just felt connected and we should do that. And God took care of it. And I'm telling you, God always has. One of the things our church has always done is we support missions. It's probably a few months ago, we, I, I petitioned our board and said, guys, I think we're at a place where we need to start picking missions up again and start doing. And, and we've had some rough months. And we, we've had probably more months in the red than in the black this year. And I just feel like God was impressed and we need to do this. And you know what? We started doing that, and, and, and not only has our income increasing, the people coming to church are increasing. God's doing it. You know why? Because God's about the kingdom. When we take care of God's business, God takes care of ours. That's what God's business is lost souls. Ours is getting back in our building, getting them stinking lawyers uh, to do their job so the insurance company will do their job. You know, that, that's what we, we're trying to get all that stuff settled. But God is not concerned with all of those things. He'll take care of those things. His concern is lost people. And so we, we, we do that, and God takes care of that. So, so, you know, when people make sacrifices and people give, you know, we have the thrift store, and people go in there, and all of our thrifty sisters that are working here, we got a couple of thrifty dudes too. But they go in there, and they sacrifice, and they give their time, and people come by and give a shirts or, or whatever y'all give. I don't know. I don't, I don't go through all the stuff. Although I do know I wear a lot of thrift store stuff. But, 
But all the sacrifices that people make, the time that they sacrifice to be there, the, the time that they give up to, to, to hang shirts, to clean stuff, whatever, it translates into souls being saved, into orphanages being built, into schools being repaired, into, into evangelistic outreach crusades being performed because somebody brought a shirt and somebody stood there and somebody sold it and somebody went by and paid for it and gave whatever, a quarter, I don't know what they pay for them shirts. But they make a, they, they, they do so well selling somebody else's stuff. I, I, I don't get it. But you know what? It's God. And so, what do you have to give? Do you think it's too little? Do you, do you think it won't matter? Well, learn the lesson that the widow woman learned. That the small gift becomes the biggest gift. Because she didn't give out of her abundance. She gave out of her lack. Amen. The second thing, I want to look in Matthew 19, 21, 22. It says, Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all you have and give the money to the poor. And you will have riches in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he was very rich. So the second thing I learn about giving is it's easier for me to give if I have stuff and stuff doesn't have me. Right? See, some people got too much stuff, they can't let go of it. Oh, no, I, I got all this, this money, this stuff, this is mine, and, and I need this, and, and, and I don't care. I, I can't let go of it. But Jesus is dealing with this young ruler. He said, hey, all you have to do, isn't it good? I mean, I love that Jesus wasn't a televangelist. Mm, if I had an organ, I'd be preaching right now. Jesus didn't say, sell all that you have and give it to the ministry, I praise God. No, it's not what he said. He said, sell everything that you have, go give it to the poor. Then you come follow me. Jesus wasn't trying to get rich on somebody else's stuff. He said, I want you. Why? Because it's a heart of somebody that doesn't let this world get a hold of them. But instead, the things that we have are simply tools to live on, tools to be blessed with, that you have something that you can use, or if it has you. I'm going to tell you, God doesn't mind you having money. But if money has you, you're not going to be able to do what you need to do. It's going to hinder you from stepping forward. And so that's why, you know, I always, when, when the youth ask me, Pastor, could you help us fry fish? I take that three-basket fish fryer that I got, and I don't say, no, I ain't letting y'all use my fish fryer. It cost me a lot of money, and I'm taking care of it. I load it up, bring it over here, and we fry fish because it's about the kingdom. I'm going to buy me a pellet smoker for the kingdom. <laughs> and me. But everything that I own, it doesn't own me. We bought us a, a new home, or we're, we're buying a new home. And since we've had that, we've been able to have more people over and do more things and, and, and pour into our people. And, and, and we couldn't do the old house, though. I love my old house, and it's been paid for right now. It wasn't comfortable to do that. It was just kind of crowded and hot, and you couldn't get it cooled off. And Well, that's not true. Four o'clock in the morning, the air conditioner would kick off. <laughs> but, you know, the, the thing is, is that those things don't have us. Sister Janet and I will not allow, and what, what we said, hey, if it ever comes to it, we need to, we'll sell the house, buy something smaller. We're not going to let the house or the things of the house, it's not going to hinder us from being what God called us to be. And if God wants us to do, we're going to do because we're not going to allow things to have us because when things have you, you're going to walk away sad from God because he's going to ask you to let him be your priority and not your stuff. And that's hard. See, it sounds easy. All the young people going, yes! That's because y'all ain't got no stuff yet. Y'all still using mom and daddy's stuff. When y'all start using your stuff, you'll start saying, wait a minute. Oh, don't be touching that. You're going to break it. My kids tore up all my stuff. <laughs> it's all right, though. I was reaping and sowing. I tore up all my daddy's stuff. My daddy used to tell me, boy, I can't have nothing. No, sir. I guess not, because I'm going to tear it up. 
But yeah, this process, a process of, of figuring out. I had to learn that if God blessed me, you know, during COVID, I mean, during the uh, storm, I had people walk up to me and give me an a, a envelope with money in it. So do anything you want to with it. I gave it away. That's what I wanted to do with it. I wanted to bless people that I knew were hurting more than me. And God knew I would do that. God sent supplies to our church. And you know what we didn't do? We didn't build storehouses and stick it all in there. We passed it through everywhere we could. Our parking lot was full. We sent people to other churches. Hey, won't you bring it to this place? They need it more than we do right now. Why? Because it's not about us. It's about God's kingdom. It's about doing what God wants us to do. But if we're caught up and we want to be the ones with all the stuff so we can get all the glory and all the pats on the back, I, I do this and I do this and I do this. If you're the one saying I all the time, stop it. Because you wouldn't be able to do anything if it wasn't for God's grace. And so we have to understand that. And God will check you on your attitude about your stuff. If God wants you to be a blessing with your stuff and you can't be a blessing with your stuff, then your stuff has you. You don't have it. And you need to check that because everything needs to belong to God. Your life, your stuff, everything. So that you're willing to say, okay, God, not my will, your will be done. Can I tell you that that principle made it easier for me to let a man to go on the missions field and not tie her up and put her in jail. Because I did not want her to go on the missions field. I wanted her to work here with me and stay with me. And all them old ugly boys go away. That's my angel girl. But I had to, she don't belong to me. She belongs to Jesus. I don't know if y'all remember, some of y'all remember you were here, we, we gave her to Jesus when she was a baby. We dedicated her and gave her back to God. I did Josh too, and, and Trey. I, gave, I dedicated all my kids and I gave them back to God. I said, God, I'll raise them, but they belong to you. And God's got his hand still on them. But y'all, that's part of the process. If you can't give God everything in your life, then you need to figure out how you're going to do that. Because you don't want God to put you in a place where you don't have a choice. Because you can lose everything thinking that you're going to hold on to it. And no matter how hard you want to hold on to something, if it's not what God wants, you're going to lose it. And what did Jesus say? What does it profit that a man gain the whole world and lose his soul? And y'all, we, we need to be mindful of that. What is it that you have that has you? What is it you can't give to God? Don't walk away sad. I learned those lessons from God that the things that I thought were so important to me, they were gone like that. And the only thing that remained was God. And I realized in that moment, that's all that mattered, that God was there. You know, Brother Kirk could probably share a testimony to tell you that all the friends in the world were fine. But when he had cancer and, and he needed a touch from God, all the friends didn't matter. He needed Jesus. And Jesus showed up, touched him, did a miracle. But, but God does that. But we have to figure out what has me and what do I have? So you have to ask yourself that. Is there anything in your life that you can't give to God? Is there anything in your life that you say, God, I'll give you that, but I can't give you this? I believe I've shared before Brother uh, Thomas Trask's brother, Brother Ray Trask, who was a, a vice president of JSBC when I went, became president before I left. He was sharing his testimony of when he was in Bible college, and, and he said that he knew he was called to missions. Amen? I mean, he knew he had a call to missions, and, and Miss Elaine, he went, to, he went to the very first chapel, his very first semester, and he went to the altar and he said, God, I'll go anywhere you want me to go, but please don't send me to China. He had family that had gone to China, and, and it was really bad. I don't know if y'all know, back in those days, China was a closed country, and they killed people. He didn't want to go to China. It was a hard place. And so every altar call for that whole semester, he was praying, God, I'll go anywhere you want me to go, but please don't send me to China. I don't want to go to China. First year passed, second year passed. 
Everybody by the third year, pretty much missionaries, knew where they were going. They were going to language school and learning languages to get ready for, to go on the field they were going on. His senior year started. He still didn't know where he was going. God just wouldn't speak, wouldn't tell him. And, and he's still praying. Finally, his last semester of Bible college, he's at the altar. He said, God, I'll go anywhere you want me to go. I'll even go to China. He said, God said, okay, I don't want you to go to China. I just want you to be willing to. <laughs> Isn't that something? God's not going to make you do what you hate. But he wants you to be willing to make whatever sacrifice he needs you to make. He needs you to be willing to say, okay, God, if that's what you want me to do, I'll do it. God, if this is the path you want me to take, I see an easier path over here, Jesus. Are you sure I can't walk that easy path? But God, I'll do whatever you want. Can I tell you, it's in your obedience that the anointing and power of God can be released. Can you imagine the story of this rich young ruler had he said, I'll be back tomorrow. I'm going to sell everything, give it away, and Jesus, I'll be here tomorrow. I mean, I, can you imagine what his testimony would have been going forward? But we never hear about him again, do we? Because he went away sad because he had great wealth. So don't, don't let yourself be that person that because you have so much stuff, you can't trust God with it, right? The next one I want us to look at, we find in Acts, things that we learn, right, from giving. 5 verse 1 says, but there was a man named Ananias who with his wife Sapphira sold some property that belonged to them, but with his wife's agreement, he kept part of the money for himself and turned the rest over to the apostles. Peter said to him, Ananias, why did you let Satan take control of you and make you lie to the Holy Spirit? By keeping part of the money you received for the property. Before you sold the property, it belonged to you. And after you sold it, the money was yours. Why then did you deceive, decide to do such a thing? You have not lied to men you have lied to God. Wow. Something that I learned from God is you can't let your giving be a matter of pride. See, some people like to talk about all the things they've done for Jesus. You ever, you ever met people like that? Well, I'll tell you, I did this and I did that and I did this and I, and I, and I, and I, and I, and I gave this. And, and usually they'll get evangel evangelistically. It'll stretch a little bit, that, that evangelistic. They start getting better and better as time goes on. I've heard some missionaries, I was told, man, their story gets better every time you hear it. Because <laughs> they, they add to it every time they tell it. But yeah, that's not what God wants us to do. He, he doesn't want us to try. Ananias and Sapphira had seen Barnabas. Barnabas sold his land, his possession, and gave all of it to the church without a thought. Because he wanted to bless the church. He wanted to bless people. People were coming in and they needed help. He said, just take it. I don't need it. I'm okay. And they saw that and they thought, hmm, I want people to think about me the way they think about Barnabas. So what I'm going to do is we're going to act like we did the same thing. Yeah, that heart is not ever going to be blessed by God. When you want somebody else's glory... You're thinking, oh, yeah, I want people to do this and think this about me and think. That's, you know, I've shared with y'all that my dad told me when I went into ministry. He said, son, always remember you're ugly. Now, it seems like kind of a harsh statement, doesn't it? But what he was saying, and he, he expounded on that. He said, the only thing good about ministers is what's good about everybody else and is Christ in us. He said, a woman who sees a man of God who loves his wife and treats her with great respect, looks at that and thinks, I go home and my husband doesn't treat me that well. And boy, I sure wish I had somebody like the pastor who would come and love me and treat me that way. And so they begin to look at the pastor as though he's something special. And, and they, they have in their heart, oh. Oh, look how wonderful he is. Oh, look at all the great things that he does. Boy, I tell you what, I sure wish I could have that. I sure wish that, that I could have him in my life. 
And the enemy has, over the years, time and time again, has called ministers to stumble into that foolishness. Here's the problem. The minute he sleeps with her, he's no longer that man. He's no longer what she fell in love with. He's no longer the the, uh, husband of fidelity. He's no longer the patient man. He's no longer the wonderful guy. Now he's just an adulterer. And so then, not only is his family's destroyed, but now the relationship's also destroyed. And his children, I'll never forget, there was a time when we were doing state business and a minister had, had committed adultery. And I was younger, a lot younger then, and, and, and I was really... I wanted to just talk, because he was, the, the minister had gotten cocky with the leadership about, y'all ain't going to come in here with me, this ain't none of y'all's business. And I thought, well, I'm going to just make a, a recommendation that we drive to his house and whoop him. <laughs> now, that was kind of my real, so I raised my hand so I could talk, because I wanted to share that great pearl of wisdom that I had received. And there was four or five guys ahead of me, Brother Greg, that were talking, right? And right before me, one of our great leaders who's with Jesus now, he said, you know, brothers, I think about the community and how it is going to be affected by this man's decision for so long. People will look at the church and they're going to think that's what we are. And I think about how it's going to cause some people not to go to church. He said, it hurts me. He said, but then I think about the children in his family, his boys and girls. And I think about how their lives will never be the same. How the man of God that they always followed now has done this. And how it will rip away their view of God. Their view of Father God. And how it will plague these children. He said, oh, it just hurts me. He said, and then I think about his wife. I think about the betrayal and the heartache. I think about the nights that she will lose sleep as she weeps and cries and wonders, will it ever truly be healed? And then he started crying. He said, oh, but guys, I think about my brother and how he has allowed the enemy to deceive him to fall from the grace of God and then with such arrogance respond to leadership. And by this time, we're all crying. He said, and my heart is so broken for a man, a brother, who has been deceived by our enemy. And when I just think we ought to pray for him. Oh, and they asked, said, brother, would you please pray and lead us? Oh, he prayed such a wonderful prayer of love and compassion. And I was the next one to speak, and I've already shared with y'all what my idea was. So when they said, Brother Packy, you're next, I said, he took care of what I needed to say. Afterwards, Brother Walt Rose pulled me to the side. He said, you were not going to say that. I said, I didn't say I was going to say that. I said, he took care of what I was going to (laughs) say. See, what happens is we put ourselves into a place where we want to put our needs ahead of everybody else's. That's what happens when leadership decides that, that they want the glory instead of letting God show his glory. And that's what Ananias and Sapphira wanted. They wanted the glory. They wanted everybody to lift them up and talk about how great they were. And when we get into a place like that, we're not making sacrifices of praise unto God. We're making appeals for people to look at us. See how great we are. Talk about us. Tell us, oh, you're such a wonderful, you're the... When people walk by, it ain't, it's not as much as it used to be. And tell me how great a job I did. I always give it to God because whether I do good or bad, it's on God because I give everything I have to him. And now I thank people, but I always say, thank, praise God. 
When people talk about, man, you're a great leader, you got your church through all this, I said, God led us through it all. God, I'm not going to take glory. I'm not looking for people to look at me and think, man, he's so this, he's so that. Yeah, I don't know if y'all know this, there'll come a time when I will step away so that the next person can step in and take this church deeper than I ever could. And that's not, it's not going to be sad. I'm going to celebrate because I will have come to my end. I will have finished my race. I will have won the fight. That's what it's about. It's not about me. It's about God. I had someone ask me one time about the church, and I said, you know what? Here's the deal. If I don't leave the church better off than I found it, I failed. If the next generation can't stand on my shoulders and reach further than they ever dreamed before, I failed. And they should say, by the time I get out of the way, man, we love Brother Packett, but we sure are glad things moved on. I want them to think about me fondly, but I don't want to be the last thing they think about. If all people remember in a hundred years is that I was a pastor that loved my people and loved God, that'll be enough. Any other accomplishment, God did anyway. That's that's what you have to know. It's not about us. Don't give to receive glory. Don't try to let your talents be what everybody does all oh, our pastors this and our pa- no god is all that we're servants who serve him i learned that's a lesson you learn from giving it's no matter what you give god put it in your hand to give it if it hadn't been for god you wouldn't have had nothing so when you give you're just giving back to god what's already his and when you remember that 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 arrogance dies and you don't have to worry about that. The last thing, some of the young people said, yes. <laughs> I think it's the last thing. I jumped over one, but we're back to it. Revelations 3, 15. I know what you have done. I know that you are neither cold or hot. How I wish you were one or the other. But because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I am going to spit you out of my mouth. One of the lessons that we learn about thinking that what we're given is good enough. That I, I, I'm given middle of the road. I'm not making a sacrifice. I'm given a little bit more than some, but not as much as others. But it's not hurting me. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not making sacrifices. I'm just kind of staying in the status quo. You know, I'm just kind of doing what, what I have to do to get by, no more, no less. Just trying to, to keep myself in good standing with the board members. Just want to make sure that when they look at my record, I gave something. You know, God calls that lukewarmness, not hot or cold. And I'm going to tell you, think about that. What is it you give to God? Do you just, in the middle, just give what you have to give? I give, I give legally what I have to give, and God, you ain't getting no more. That's, my, that's all I got to give. But you know, it says tithes and offering. Sometimes an offering's not money. Sometimes it is your time. Sometimes your offering is your love for people. Sometimes an offering is showing up to be a listening ear for a hurting brother or sister sometimes that offering is just sitting there while other people cry that's a powerful tool i remember when when my brother uh, eddie his wife laura jean passed away it was such a horrible time in our family because laura jean was so good she was too good for eddie i told her so they were married right at 20 years. She waited on him hand and foot. I mean, she, whatever he wanted, it didn't matter. I got it, I got it. I said, Lord, Jean, stop. He doesn't deserve to be treated that good. Well, he, she, she passed. She, she went one morning, and she was gone. And I drove to Alexandria. My mom was, she'd been on staff here three months. 
Laura Jean told her, said, oh, you'll be back in three months. Three months. And she did. She moved back. But I got to the hospital, and I hugged Eddie, and I said, Eddie, it's going to be okay. He looked me straight in the eye and said, I don't believe you. And started crying. And you know what? I didn't say another word to him. I held him and cried with him because that's all I could give him, a brokenness. He was just broken, and I gave that to him. And you know what? It made a difference in his life. That was the sacrifice I made that day. I made a sacrifice of not trying to have all the right answers. You remember when I, I showed up and Luke was, was gone, and I'm tell you, all the way to Alexander, I tried to come up with a pastoral answer to this baby being gone and I, I mean I argue with God all the way there give me something I'm not going to show up there and have nothing to say you need to give me the words that's going to heal them because I need to have the answers now I'm going to tell y'all I'm pretty good under pressure I, I am you know Sometimes small things irritate me, but I'm good under a lot. Bad stuff happens. I'm pretty good. And, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, God, you're, you need to help me here because I'm, I don't have anything to say. So I got there and I walked into the, to the room and Miss Hannah said, Pastor, you want to hold Luke? And the furthest thing from my mind, I want to tell her something that's going to heal her. And I said, yeah, and I held him and I just cried. And I kept a pause. I said, I'm so sorry. I, I'm here to try to comfort you. And all I can do is cry like a baby. I, I, I gave Luke and I went outside and cried. I, tried. I said, I've got to get myself together. I need to get up here. I need to be the pastor and I need to answer this stuff. I walked back in there and started crying like a baby again. All I could do was cry. I said, God, you're not helping me. He said, you're not the one who needs help, son. And, and, and me being human was what they needed. They didn't need me to have the answer. There was no answer. There's no answer at moments like that. We just need to be loved. That's all we need. And I remember Jonathan told me, he said, we're not going to get it. We're not going to make it. I said, you're going to be okay. He said, we're not going to make it. I said, you're going to be okay. We're not going to make it. I said, you're going to be okay. He said, Pastor, I don't see how we're going to make it. I said, have I ever lied to you, Jonathan? He said, no, sir. I said, you're going to make it. Stop. Trust God. He said, yes, sir. That's the end of it. That, I guess that's what I got to say. That, that was my pastor stuff. Stop it. But y'all, in that moment, I would not have wanted somebody who was, well, I'm on the clock, let me get up there and say, hey, okay, well, we'll be praying. That's not, that's not what people need. They don't need somebody who's just given that little what I have to give and no more. That's not what the world needs. The world doesn't need a church full of people who show up on Sunday morning because that's what I signed the contract to. And I'll be there on Sunday morning, but rest of the week I'm going to be doing my own thing. Y'all, that's lukewarmness and I ain't going to have no part of it myself. And I don't want God to look at me and get sick. I want him to look at me and say, that's one of mine right there. We got him on fire. We're setting him out. He is doing what I've called him to do. Because I'm going to tell you something. You learn from just getting by, just to get by. You lose your fire for God. You lose your purpose. You lose your direction. Now, this is not meant to be done out of duty, but out of passion. God wants a people of passion who are out here serving him so that the, when the world looks into the church, they say, I need that. That's what I need. I've had everything else. I've tried all the stuff that they say will work. None of it works. I, I, I'm going to try. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go to church. And if they get to church, you can come, Jen. I'm getting ready to close. We get to church and, and people are acting foolish. People are not loving Jesus the way they're supposed to. And a hurting, bleeding, dying world shows up. And they leave just like they got here. Because there's no healing here. Because there's no, there's no holiness here. There's no, there's no anointing. There's no following God. There's no power. I remember 
when Sister Loretta, you remember she shared the dream, Miss Connie, that she had that this looked like a triage. On one side, there were sick people who were broken and bleeding and, and needed help. And, and in the middle of the place was a, like hospital beds. People were stuck in there, IV stuck in their arm. They were, they were getting better. And on the other side was the patients that were ready to leave again. She said, God said, this is going to be a place where he's going to bring in the broken and the hurting. And he's going to heal them and send them out again. And y'all, that's what we're called to be. That's what the church is called to be. We are called to be a place of restoration. We are called to be a place of healing. We are called to be a place where the broken can come in and be made whole. That's what we're about. But if we're only doing the lukewarm garbage, I'm just doing what I got to do to get by, there is no power or anointing in that. I don't want that. Why would we think the world would want that? right some lessons that I learned about giving right I just wanted to share those with you tonight that you can learn some things about your giving remember it's not about how big your gift is it doesn't matter what other people think about your gift it's what it costs you that's what God's looking at you know it's about making sure that Nothing in your life has you that that you can give God whatever he asks for at any moment because you trust him with it. You know, that, that we don't allow pride to be connected to our giving. That we, that we give unto God because he deserves it. And y'all, that we don't, don't give in, in a way that is just middle of the road. I did what I had to do, not a penny more. But y'all, there's that offerings of, of who we are, whether, whether it's money or whatever else it is. Are you willing to make a sacrifice? Tithing is, is for me, is without question, it's what we do. The offering aspect of it is, is unlimited. What are, you, what are you willing to give to God? What are you willing to sacrifice for God? Y'all, can you imagine what God could do with your little sacrifice? He took a few fish and a few loaves of bread, fed 5,000. Two fish, seven loaves. 5,000 people. But they had to give it to him first. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If my prayer team could please come and line up here in the front. We're going to give some time for prayer if anybody wants prayer. But if you're here today and you say, Pastor, I, I need to be better at giving unto God. I need my motives. I, need, I, need all I, I just need to be better at giving unto God. If that's you, I just want you to slip your hand up, put it back down, and say, that's me, Pastor. I just, I'm, not, I'm not giving like I should give. And I want to make that better. Would y'all stand to your feet? I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for your word. I ask that, Lord God, you would allow this word to burn within our hearts. That, Lord God, we would be the givers you want us to be. That, God, we would give everything that we can. Trying to get for what we give. But God, just wanting to be obedient to you. Father, I ask that you would just bless us and watch us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you need prayer.